uh, hi uh, good afternoon everyone uh, first of all let me apologize for the delay there was some technical glitch we are still working on it uh, please bear with us for a few minutes we will be starting soon Yeah, I think we are good to go. Uh, sorry again. Uh, I welcome you all to our unique series of webinars. Thank you so much for participating wholeheartedly. And yes, this is again Dr. Ankur Lart, Scientific Manager, Hoiba. I uh, hope you enjoyed our past sessions, which covered all about platelets and RBC, mainly focusing on diseases prevalent in monsoon. So now coming to the today's topic and content. Monsoon is not only about cool breeze, drizzle and greenery. With it, it brings many diseases. And it seems like COVID was not enough. Uh, with monsoon, we are seeing viral fevers, dengue, malaria, chikungunya, gastroenteritis and whatnot. So like uh, whenever there is any disease, first investigation is complete blood count. And primarily, it's about WBC. You all would agree that WBC is the most imperative parameter leading us to the diagnosis uh, with its unique form, color, size, and more. Be it infection, malignancy, or allergy. Our first observation is leukocyte count. So in this unique series, Count Beyond Cells, today we will learn all about WBC. Today we will learn all about WBC. Uh, some findings are evident on hematology analyzers, which can be missed on manual microscopy, specifically in case of malignancy and low cellularity smear. And yes, we are also having some rare cases which unquestionably will captivate you. Like we will see that findings we see as false alarms or flag are sometimes indication towards some diseases. Today, analyzers are enhanced, advanced, simplified, and have changed the process of analyzing blood. Uh, under Oncology Awareness Campaign, we are happy to share a few good cases on our oncology today. So get ready for exciting session, and which will also cover questions and answers at the end of the session. Meanwhile, you can type your queries in the chat box. Uh, so without wasting much time, let me call upon Dr. Gautam Gopal Bhagwat, young, energetic, and dynamic, and with special interest in hematology. He is consultant hematopathologist, senior director of hematology, immunohematology, and flow cytometry section at prestigious Suraksha Diagnostics, Kolkata. 
he has done fellowship in laboratory hematology from tata medical center kolkata and uh, he has got hands on training at university of salamanca spain in flow cytometric analysis of various hematological malignancy and mrd analysis in 2019 he received the bernard howen travel award at the annual conference of the islh in vancouver canada his areas of interest are hematology oncology and flow cytometry and he has many uh, papers and publication to his credential so welcome on board dr bhagwat over to you yeah good afternoon everyone am i audible dr ankur yeah yeah, yeah very much please go ahead so I, i hope everybody is healthy and doing good now that we are back with our routines everybody must be busy and thanks for taking out time on this thursday afternoon so first of all i'd like to thank dr ankur and hariba for giving me this opportunity um, after two beautiful sessions excellent sessions by two of the senior hematopathologists and well known figures in this area dr handu and dr srinivas who spoke about platelets and uh, rbc involvement in this monsoon season and the diseases which we see in monsoon season i really feel honored to get this opportunity to be kind of sharing this same platform and talking on the third important cell of our in the peripheral blood and that is the white blood cell now now saga literally means a long and a complicated story however i can assure you this is not going to be long and definitely it is not going to be complicated i'll try to simplify things to you but we all know that these warriors these the, the, the immune system the most important part of our immune system the wbcs they play a big role when these with when, when any of the diseases uh, is encountered by human body the aim of my presentation throughout this another 20 to 30 minutes would be what experience do we have with cases that we get in our day to day life i'll not be talking much about rarities or so but it would be what i have experienced or or for that matter of fact what all of us experience uh, during these 3 or 4 months of monsoon uh, india is a big country and it is a it very variations throughout regions depending on which disease is uh, more common in what area but to say so the most common diseases would if i would count on fingers would be dengue malaria chikungunya some cholera typhoid or water borne diseases so these are the most common diseases that we experience during this 2 to 3 season and not to leave uh the covid or covid 19 before covid 19 it was the flu which is still prevalent but we are not very sure which one is flu and which one is covid so but the respiratory diseases are very common so whenever i try to whenever i tried to start this presentation it was about a month ago that i was supposed to do this presentation but but we we due to some reasons it is being done now so at that time i put up certain image uh, in my google search i put up monsoon india such keywords and i got a page full of different images definitely there were these beautiful pictures of uh, some ray of hope the rainbows beautiful picnic spots good uh scenic views but then there were also the photographs of disaster because of monsoon so with all the good things that the monsoon brings with it it also brings some kind of disaster such as these floods or the landslides and whatever be the area it uh the the it the it depends whether you are in a hilly area or whether you are in some area near the sea coast but there are uh such disasters which occur during this monsoon season and also with these photographs i had these photographs of the warriors and from there i got this idea to keep this topic as the uh, warriors of uh, the saga of the warriors in the monsoon and then i thought yes our wbc is the white blood cells are the ones which are fighting against whatever disaster this monsoon is bringing to our human body uh, we must we are really thankful to all the soldiers who not only protect our boundaries but whenever there is any such situation in our country within the land they are the first ones to go there they are the first ones to help us and bring back life 
well the monsoon season brings with it the vector borne diseases and as i told the most commoner ones are those because of mosquito and which are malaria dengue and chikungunya along with that you also experience filaria and japanese encephalitis the other problem is because of this water and the water borne diseases such as cholera typhoid etc are again very common and the third one we cannot leave out uh, the uh, flu so the common viral flu or the covid 19 disease whatever but these are the diseases which we have experienced in the past 3 or 4 months in the patients which the the which have provided us with their blood samples for cbc and who comes to the aid when this is when we face such a situation or such diseases so they are our immune warriors or the wbc they fight against them and in doing that what happens is there are certain immunomorphological changes which we try to pick up from our complete blood counts and the uh, peripheral smear morphology well uh, i would present few cases and through those cases i'll try to tell you the story of these wbcs and meanwhile i'll also all these cases are from the past 3 months and uh, so coming to the first one is a case of a 38 years old female now in all the labs we have these cell counters and i am sure now there is no lab which has which doesn't have a automated cell counter to do the complete blood counts so the first thing when we have uh, verified the uh, integrity of the sample if everything is correct what is the workflow we directly put these samples into our counters and then we look for the counts so when we did that what i get here was two or three significant findings one was there were 71% lymphocytes the second thing was that the platelet count was 82000 which is on a lower side but along with that the mean platelet volume which shows the size of the platelet was on a higher side indicating that there were larger platelets or the giant platelets in this uh, sample and the third finding or the count which i got was a flag or so called red mark of the atypical lymphocytes that were 6.4% so given these three things what do we what do i or what do all of us usually do is we look more into the scattergrams we look more into the histograms and then we look into the slide but the question that comes to our mind is whether these abnormalities are only quantitative or there are any qualitative abnormalities or it is both are there any flags which you which the machine would give us or are there any flags which i should bring out of the machine when i look into the slide i must know i must look into whether the cell is a normal or it is reactive or is it a neoplastic and bringing together all the counts the information derived from the scattergrams the histograms from the peripheral smear morphology microscopy can i combine all the findings and associate it to any disease so these are the few questions which comes to our mind once we look into any sample most of the normal samples just go through other samples we would just check for the scattergrams histograms others we would definitely make a slide look into it diagnose try to diagnose whatever disease we can diagnose but do we really know what a wbc looks like now everybody will say yeah we definitely have been taught what a wbc looks like but what point i am trying to make over here is what wbc looks like has been shown to us by it all depends on what modality or are we using and i never miss putting this picture into my presentations because these are the two uh, gentlemen who enab have enabled us today to become what we are because we look into the slides we call ourselves as hematopathologists and without a microscope without romanovsky stain there uh, 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 being a hematopathologist is not possible so i really uh, salute these two people for giving me this but what wbc looks like is what they have shown us so everybody would say yes this peripheral smear shows me a lymphocyte and a neutrophil why because i see it like that into the microscope but many things changed when 
these two people come up came up so the first one mr coulter everybody knows and i need not tell anything about it him but the second person is one who created the prototype of the flow cytometer so now how do a wbc look when these two people came into the picture the modalities that these two uh, these two stalwarts gave us so the coulter principle will show me a wbc like this to the extreme left would be a lymphocyte to the extreme right would be a neutrophil if i look for a wbc in a flow cytometer a cd45 side scatter will show me a lymphocyte as a low side scatter bright cd45 a neutrophil would be a high moderate to high side scatter and a moderate cd45 so it all depends on the modality how a wbc looks like but all said and done it is the man who has to look into the machine or the microscope and if i have the knowledge of all these things it becomes much easier to uh, decipher the clue and to get to a diagnosis of the patient with the advent of all these machine the wbc started looking like this so it all depends on what machine you are using and then if you know what your machine gives the information and how a wbc looks like into your machine you can get lots and lots of clues so machine is going to tell you everything it is you if you know how what it is telling if you can decipher the code then you can reach to a diagnosis you can help in patient care well uh, dr coulter had his patent on a whole it is a long story i'm not going to go through it but this was a important milestone and after this it revolutionized the complete blood counting and everything well, now we are entirely uh, relying on what our machine gives us for the counting nobody is doing the uh, hemoglobin with the hemocyte with the uh, sign myth globin method or the wbc counts with the hemocytometer etc it is all uh, coulter based counters which we use almost all the counters are coulter based and our primary counts that is the total wbc count hemoglobin and the platelet counts come through the coulter principle so what is the coulter principle cells are counted by passing a dilute solution of the blood through an aperture across which an electric current is flowing the passage of the cells through the current changes the impedance between the terminals which is the coulter principle and thus the sizing and counting of cells is based on this measurable change in the electrical impedance we get a histogram histogram is measurable and from that we get the counts as well as size given as various uh, parameters in our cbc report what happens into a machine again it is same across all the machine types that we are using some of the sample that is aspirated would would go into a rbc and platelet chamber where it would be counting the rbcs and the platelets and giving you the sizes and giving you that that is the histogram so mcv rdw and the counts everything coming through that and the M, mpv etc another part of the sample would go into a lysis chamber where the cells are lysed and here the total wbc count takes place and the hemoglobin estimation is done now this is up to the three part that we say going further you would have a part going into uh, another chamber where you will be getting the scattergram or the wbc differential based on whatever principle the machine is using so that would be your five part analyzer along with that if you have a reticulocyte channel some part of the sample goes into that and so on and so forth depending on the uh, machine depending on the machine that you are using impedance counting everybody knows is based on the cell size and we get the events on the oscilloscope and then you get a histogram a classical three part histogram and there is lots and lots of information in this three part histogram now basically what happens is the most the, the cells to the extreme right are those with the more complex nucleus or the more larger nucleus so actually what happens is we know that the monocyte is the largest cell the neutrophil being the second largest cell but however this everything is happening in a lysis chamber and therefore the cells tend to lyse and therefore the 
the one cell which has the most complex and the largest nucleus that is the neutrophil will go to the right hand side the lymphocyte which has the smallest nucleus will go to the left hand side and all those cells which have the medium sized nucleus would stay in the between in the uh, the middle part of the peak and depending on that if you have five lobed neutrophils it, it will be to the most extreme right hand side if you have more of a two lobed neutrophil or a band cell or a myelocyte it will again come shift towards the left and come in the between if you have a lymphocyte predominant population the number of new, the 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 height of the neutrophil and the monocyte would be uh, a bit on the lower side if you have the mid population going high then it could be a monocytosis it could be a eosinophil it could be many other things it could be a left shifting it could be acute leukemia you can see many things if you get a peak left to the lymphocyte it could be a peak of uh, nucleated rbc so there is so much of information that you get through a three part histogram but still we usually tend to then go into looking into a five part because all of us has a five part instrument but still why i pointed out the importance of a three uh, of a histogram because in my case i had only one information the patient is a 38 years old female with then the cell counter gives me the information that there is a lymphocytosis a thrombocytopenia and a flag of um, atypical lymphocytes now what do i see in this histogram so there are almost three to four peaks in this histogram two of the peaks are on the left hand side so i know there are two populations so there is a varied population of the lymphocytes that is there is a, a, a significant size difference between the uh, lymphocytes or else i should say that there are pleomorphic lymphocytes and the, then the neutrophils the lower part so from here i got that there the lymphocytes were pleomorphic and then i looked into the slide so this is the slide till now i have only one information 38 years old female lymphocytosis now what do i see in this definitely i see the sizes or the nuclear sizes are different and there is lots of pleomorphism all the cells do not look alike there are different different shapes and sizes of the cells so this is a pleomorphic population now coming to what is normal so normal we know is a small lymphocyte or some some population of a larger lymphocyte yeah so the left top image is of a small lymphocyte which is normal 7 to 10 microns dense chromatin in conspicuous nucleus if at all or mostly the nucleus nucleolus is not present and a very scant cytoplasm so this is a normal looking lymphocyte so what is a abnormal abnormal is something which is not normal or what is atypical something which is not typical is this second cell that is the right hand side top cell is this an abnormal cell no this is a normal cell till the time the counts are less than 600 microliter or say around 10 to 15% it is a large granular lymphocyte a large granular lymphocyte can be seen in up to 600 microliter in a normal person and it is not alarming if you see such cells yes the left bottom and the right bottom do not look very much normal there are two things things one is the uh, molding of the cytoplasm over the rbc this is because the cell is larger and the cytoplasm is fragile so it molds over the rbc and the nucleus does not look so dense as it is in the above top two cells and the third has a definitely a basophilic tinge or a bluish tinge uh, most likely it is a plasma cell or a plasma cytoid cell whatever you want to call it but the top two are the normal ones the bottom two are the abnormal ones the top two are the typical ones the normal two are the bottom two are the atypical ones and where do did i get all these photographs so uh that i'll come to my next slide so this is a beautiful paper i have just kept this uh, uh slide to tell you that all these cells can be normal all these cells can be abnormal depending on the level of the examiner looking into it so there are two things to this one knowledge of what is abnormal is very very important 
and second what kind of abnormal cells can you get is also very very important now the four cells that i had shown you uh, i got it from i think i have missed the slide or i have put it at anyways well so uh, this is a beautiful uh, again um, uh, paper from the icsh the international society uh, which uh, recommends almost everything for the hematology and uh, uh, they have uh, this paper was in 2015 for peripheral blood smear morphological features and i usually come go again and again to this paper to look into uh, uh, sometimes when i am in doubt i go back to this paper read it and every time i read it i get something new from it but there are few points which i like to emphasize one is that lymphocytes predominantly are small 10 to 12 microns some may be large lymphocytes the lgls compromise up to 10 to 20% that is around 600 per microliter of the peripheral blood lymphocytes in normal subjects the recommendation is that lgl should be counted as lymphocytes but may be commented on if they are present in increased numbers because we definitely know that there is a lymphoma which has large number of lgls so when you get large number of LGLs, you have to report it separately. But till the time they are within range 10 to 20 percent, you may count it into the lymphocytes only. Lymphocyte morphology is subject to wide variability due to various immunological stimuli, both in inflammatory and infectious disease, as well as in neoplastic disorders. So from here we get that the lymphocytes may show variable morphology because of either infectious diseases or because of neoplasm so benign diseases or the neoplastic diseases well there are wide number of terminologies used variant reactive abnormal activated and atypical downy cells downy one to two downy three turk cell immunoblast monocytoid lymphocytes etc so these are the various terminologies which have been proposed which have been given which creates a lot of confusion not all clinicians are aware, uh, aware of what these terminologies mean not all residents are uh, aware of what these terminologies mean and therefore icsh recommends to use only two terminologies one is reactive lymphocytes reactive lymphocyte is used to de describe lymphocytes with a benign etiology Second is abnormal lymphocytes with an accompanying description of the cell which describes the lymphocytes if you suspect it as a malignant or clonal etiology. Now, every time it is not possible to get the etiology, we never know whether it is a benign or malignant, but it is always a good idea to describe the cell if you, are, if you think it is abnormal, atypical, reactive, whatever name you give. If you think that it is always better to describe the cell in your report, I tend to use reactive lymphocytes for benign etiology and atypical lymphocyte or abnormal lymphocyte for a malignant etiology. Then do we count this into our differential? <coughs> so it depends on how significant the number is. So if the reactive lymphocytes are in larger numbers or the abnormal lymphocytes are in larger numbers it is always better to give it as a different in a separate category of differential now those four cells that i, I was coming back to i think this is the slide so now those four cells which I, which I had shown you were of the same case so we had four cells seen one was a normal small lymphocyte one was a, was a lgl one was a reactive lymphocyte with a larger uh, more number more cytoplasm molding over the rbc then one was a plasma cytoid lymphocyte then i got the history that this patient presented with fever also if you see in the left bottom there were giant thrombocytes so which the information my counter had also given me that there the mpv was more than 12 so we had we, we had the following information now with us one was there was lymphocytosis thrombocytopenia with presence of giant thrombocytes or the large platelets the patient was suffering of fever and there were reactive lymphocytes in the peripheral blood smear in such situations usually i try to look into the microbiology reports if the dengue has been reported 
it's okay. Most of the times you will find that the dengue is positive. If not, we would call up the microbiology department to check with them and just try to triage these cases to be done on a priority basis. Because with all the situation, with this season, you are almost sure that this is a case of a viral disease, most likely a dengue. So coming on to different analyzers, what information am I getting from different analyzers? Different analyzers have different principles and therefore they give you different information. Basically the information given might be same, but it is the way of representation that is different. And here I would strongly recommend you whenever you buy a new machine or you have an existing machine, it is always better to get to the application people, ask them time and again, the principles behind it, the understanding of the flags, the understanding of the scattergram, the principle on which this uh, counters are based and what all information can you get derived from it. Because it helps a lot when you are reporting cases, if you know your machine in and out. What these machine do is, they give us representations in different ways. The numerical data is one, histograms is two, differential cell analysis is three, flags and lab actions is four. All the machines would give you this four information. Taking into account all those four informations, you get lots and lots of information which you will always find correlating with something on the other. And there are many, many, many papers. There are many sessions on cytomorphometry where you can go in, you can check. And there is so much into it that the machines have almost replaced the slides. Well, talking of the Horiba machine, so uh, it does the differential based on the size and the absorbance. Now, the lymphocytes are small in size and very small absorbance or diffraction. So it is basically based on the extinction of the light. So a source of light goes through the cell and whatever slide, whatever light is absorbed or scattered or diffracted, all is uh, taken away and whatever remaining light is kept is taken into analysis. The monocytes are volume is big extension is small, neutrophils medium, medium and so on so forth and accordingly you get this graph. So those cells which are extreme to the left you know are uh, show less uh, extinction and those cells which are to the right would be more and depending on the size accordingly. The another thing which you uh, need to take care of is that if you see there is an overlap between the cells and because of these overlap, there is shifting of these lines according to the cell clusters. And when there is shifting of the line, a certain population can get overlapped into the other and to avoid this, this shifting is done. So this minimizes the overlap of two population, but as this all is based on size and extinction, there can be overlapping populations. Um, based on the scattergram, recently uh, uh, the, the Dr. Parag Dharap has already published papers and recently uh, there was a newsletter from Horiba and so a study which took place Pan India Suraksha Diagnostics also was a part of it. So how Umizen H550 is used for screening and classification uh, of type of malaria. So we had very good results with this uh, machine and there are certain set, threshold set uh, depending on the cell data and based on the that threshold uh, you get the suspicious flag for either malaria or dengue and not only that the best feature which i uh, found was it is malaria vivax or malaria falciparum which uh, hardly any other uh, machine would give as a flag to you uh, and the, the sensitivity and specificity was excellent. So more and more research will bring in more and more data from this. But the initial data looks very nice and uh, we were very happy with this study. And all credit to Dr. Parag Dharab who had initially started this initiative. Coming on to other analyzers, the Siemens analyzers uses uh, the uh, enzyme activity of the peroxidase. So the cell size is something which is common throughout the uh, instruments because that is one thing which 
which is always going to be there on any one of the axes. The other axes might change depending on the machine, depending on the technology as it's uses. So this Siemens machine uses the peroxidase activity and peroxidase is an enzyme which is, you know, present mostly in the neutrophils, eosinophils and such. And accordingly, you get the uh, uh, various cell uh, locations. The uh, beckman coulter machines would use the volume, conductivity and scatter, volume giving the size, conductivity giving you the chemical composition and the nuclear volume, the scatter giving you the granularity, the complexity of the cell. The machine would uh, uh, accumulate or take in consideration values from all these three channels and then gives you a 3D data based on the template. It would give you the uh, um, counts or the differential analysis. There are instruments from Sysmex, Mindray, who would be using the fluorescence counts and uh, size as the parameters and based on the fluorescence used, it will give you the location of the various uh, uh, differential cells. In fact, it also gives a very important parameter, which is uh, the HFC percentage, which has been used a lot uh, for the uh, reactive lymphocytes, which come into the, that HFC percentage uh, uh, template. So, th so various instruments, various technologies. I the this was not a platform to get into details of all those. Neither did I have time to do that. But what I want to emphasize is, it is always better to know your instrument in and out if you want to get the maximum information because. The machine sees the WBC in a different way. And if you don't know it, you won't be able to see what information your machine is going to give you. Well, coming on to my next case, after I have discussed this differential analysis. Now, this is a known case of a dengue positive NS1 ELISA positive, 18 years old female. What I get over here is there is a lot of overlap in the scattergram. If you look down into the scattergram, maybe the next slide. No. So if you look down into the scattergram, there is a lot of overlap in the uh, uh, in this uh, scattergram. Also, the counting of basophils in a horiba would be through a different basophil channel where you put in the solution to lyse the basophils and basophils are resistant to this lysis. Yeah, all the other cells would lyse, but the basophil would be resistant. So similarly, the reactive lymphocytes are also resistant sometimes. And therefore, what happens here is that you get a differential count, which has a 36% lymphocyte, 33% monocyte, 6% basophil. Now, is this true monocytosis and true basophilia? So no, when I know that this is a dengue positive patient, I have seen this slide, no doubt. But I am not showing you the images. These are all reactive cells. The larger cells, the lyse resistant cells, the cells with more complexity, those going into the monocyte and the basophil channel. And this is a pseudo monocytosis or a pseudo, pseudo basophilia, which would be commonly seen when you have the reactive lymphocytes. Such pseudo monocytosis might also be seen when you have um, uh, neutrophilia with sepsis. So larger neutrophils might tend to go into the monocytes because the monocyte neutrophil channels are very close to each other. So you might get pseudo monocytosis. Whenever you see such, don't blame the instrument. I, I was just hearing a talk from Dr. Sukesh Nair, sir. He has emphasized on this point a lot and I took this from there only. And in fact, I used to complain to one of the machine vendors that monocytosis is a hai. But uh, Ultimately, when you look into it, as I told you, if you get into the machine, you go in and out, you see what is happening. You know that the machine is not to be blamed. If your controls are doing good, if your ECAS is doing good, your machine is giving you what it is seeing. It is now up to you how you see it. And therefore, this was the pseudomonocytosis, pseudobasophilia. All were lymphocytes, all were reactive lymphocytes. Coming on to another case of a lymphocytosis. Now, there are two reasons why I have put the this case and the next one to this. One is that we are talking of lymphocytosis, which is coming in the monsoon season. And second is because kind of celebrating this oncology day, oncology week and everything. So here we had this case, a known case of BNHL having a high count, WBC count of 14,000, lymphocyte 77%. 
platelet count on lower side thrombocytopenia and two important things that i am getting a uh, at- atypical lymphocyte flag of 30% and when i see into the scattergram these are all cells which are larger than the normal lymphocyte and look at the histogram there is only a single peak all the cells are almost monomorphic there is no pleomorphism in this case if you look into the sl- uh, cells again you would find that the nucleus of all cells is almost similar it looks malignant there is a prominent nucleoli in few of few of those with the background of the knowledge of that this was a bnhl this case was not tough to diagnose that this was a lymphoma spillover and we could give it so the point to be noted here was you will get lymphocytosis which is not reactive in monsoons you have to one know the history second look at the histograms the scattergrams and look into the slide and decide accordingly i reported it as a abnormal or atypical lymphocyte i described it and in the note i had put that it is a known case of bnh again a lymphocytosis so not only lymphocytosis along with that monocytosis a platelet count of 29000 thrombocytopenia but what do i get here are four flags one is immature monocytes one is immature lymphocytes one is large immature cells and one is atypical lymphocyte so i am getting four flags if i see into the scattergram everything is everything is scattered over if all the spread over all the places including into the immature channels i knew this was acute leukemia this were the cells a 6 years old female we reported as acute leukemia further doing a flow it was a classical pre ball case sometimes it becomes interesting practicing in a stand alone lab the biggest drawback if i should say so is you don't get a history and if at all you get a history you never know what is what has happened after that because you don't get a follow up of the patient so this is one of the cases now this patient was a known case of bcl but he was in remission so his counts were normal throughout there were hardly any atypical abnormal cells in his peripheral blood smear and then he presented here this is around 1 month ago 2 months ago and his lymphocyte count if you see the absolute lymphocyte count it was 6490 so definitely this is absolute lymphocytosis and in a patient who is a known case of bcll i had very less doubt that this patient has a uh, is ha- has come back the disease has come back he is now not in remission and the atypical lymphocytes the flag shows was 8.6% although the patient was on treatment he was in remission so there was no point that he was coming back and usually if you see cll cases i know most of you must have seen cll cases the counts are not 9250 you would get counts in 30000 50000 1 lakh whatever but this was a case and then i looked into the slide now the slide had cells on the left hand side if you see my digital analyzer the cell vision had put it into the lymphocytes the nuclear sizes were varying it was a pleomorphic population and moreover this cell were not looking as those of a cll this was not the classical soccer ball appearance that you could see in a cll patient were these pro lymphocytes so no i would not call these as pro lymphocytes maybe one or two doubtful cells but no uh, to progress further to pro lymphocytic leukemia you should have more number of cells and then there were these cells which had no cytoplasm the cell vision had put it into the smut cell category but again you all must have seen many cll cases and the smut cells don't look like this maybe the second cell is type of a smut cell that we see uh, the fragile lymphocytes but these were not smut cells and i was in a fix how to report this case however i reported this case as seeing abnormal lymphocytes and i described it entirely so it was at least two or three lines description on various types of cell that i have seen also i called up the clinician to tell him that this doesn't look like a remission of cll i don't know what it is but it doesn't look like um 
after about 3 days i got a flow cytometry sample for this and uh, it was quite logical because for that clinician he had to make sure that this was not a remission of cll and to my surprise what i got on my flow cytometer was that there were almost 90% t lymphocytes and only 8 to 9% b lymphocytes and those b lymphocytes were not restricted so there was no kappa lambda restriction now getting into those t lymphocytes we had an altered cd4 cd8 ratio so two possibilities were suggested one either this patient is going into some kind of t lymphoma which i was not sure or the other was that this was a reactive lymphocytosis and we needed to uh, rule out the viral etiology so uh, i must admit here and i must apologize also i don't know what happened to this case maybe a uh, few learned uh, people in the audience might uh, put some light in the question answer sessions on this but uh, to be very frank i don't know what happened to this because i didn't get any follow up of this case but again just to emphasize a lymphocytosis you have to be very careful on what you are dealing with coming to my next case now it is not only about lymphocytes as i told cholera typhoid everything it is not only about the qualitative thing you have to look into the quantitative aspect of that also and to put up few points we all know typhoid would present as a neutropenia or a leptospira which is a common uh, disease in the western part uh, a leptospira with a high neutrophil count usually indicates that it is a severe disease so there are quantitative things which you must look into uh, quantitative values also which you must look into while you are reporting your cases now this was a 3 years old child hospitalized with high grade fever chills and rigors the hemoglobin was 9 the wbc count was a one a, was on a higher side and for a 3 years old child the 63% neutrophil is again on a higher side and what do we see here is the uh, basophilic granules and the cytoplasmic vacuolations into the uh, neutrophil the crp was raised it was a dengue and malaria negative case but when you look into such uh, toxic granules or the cytoplasmic vacuolations you know that you are dealing with some kind of bacterial infection or or a sepsis or a very severe infection sometimes in very severe infection whether it be viral also you might see this or a secondary infection to viral you might see this so but such cases are important critical to be reported so it is not only about lymphocytes neutrophils also uh you will see in which you will find some findings and it is important to report on this then this is covid i will not talk about it much because there are webinars and webinars all over regarding covid but yes nlr was something which came up a big deal um still it is be reported although we have many many more parameters which are the uh, predictive markers for uh, covid 19 and i really hope this third wave doesn't come and we don't have any more webinars on covid 19 let it stop here only so i am really hopeful about that let's see what happens uh, but yes uh, whosoever is interested uh, we can have another session on uh, covid 19 specific wbc changes morphologically you might not see many many changes there although there are certain papers but uh, one thing more which is which has come up is this tb nk analysis that is the t cell b cell and nk cell analysis and there are many many papers uh, which suggest cut off for the cd4 cd8 values for predicting whether a patient might land up in icu or may require ventilation etc so this has come up few few private labs have also started this screening test for the tb nk and uh, this is also very good and very Uh, very reliable parameter so so to to say but again as i said i am not going to talk about covid because i don't want the third wave to come coming on to uh, a disease malaria which all of us know now wbcs might give you a sign that malaria is present and there are again many papers which show the presence of hemozoin pigment in the uh, wbc so you can pick up this pigment if at all and then you can try to search for the uh, malaria or you can do an antigen card test which most of us have been doing now well uh, this would be one of my last cases this actually came to me last evening 
and uh, i had almost prepared my presentation and then when this came i told dr ankur that i am going to put up this uh, case also because there was something important which i saw in this and i thought of reporting so this is a 40 years old male hemoglobin 13.5 wbc 6.4 good enough the platelet counts for 45000 what do we see in the peripheral blood smear is uh, i hope you can all see uh, towards the 1230 o'clockish we have this ring form present in the rbc and you can see clearly two chromatin dots with the ring and towards the bottom side near the left to the box uh, there is a rbc infested with the malaria but this has a single chromatin dot and a thickish kind of a ring so we do a antigen card test and what do we find is that this is a mixed infection showing both plasmodium vivax as well as plasmodium falciparum now this is something which might be common many many of us have seen this uh, mixed infection but what extra did i find in this was if you could see there are cytoplasmic vacuolations in this cell. so definitely some other process is also going on so i searched up the papers today morning only there are certain papers which indicates the presence of toxic granules or the toxic changes are associated with severe falciparum malaria most of them them tend to be in icu and uh, the mortality rate is also high because there is cns involvement the second thing which i found in this was there were again few reactive lymphocytes if you see in the right hand side uh, column of the cell vision page so the first two looks like reactive the bottom one you can see larger lymphocytes which are molding over the rbcs you can see some one or two normal lymphocytes with one or two large granular lymphocytes so pleomorphic rbcs with reactive lymphocytes and the third thing which i found was if you could all appreciate in this cell towards the right hand side you can see certain blue colored thing we call it as dole bodies which is a remnant rna there are also few toxic granules in this cells the basophilic cells so this patient had severe infection now i don't know whether this patient has a superseding bacterial septicemia also or whether this patient has such severe falciparum malaria infection that these toxic changes are seen in this but it is not only about re reporting the presence of malaria if you find such findings are associated with it it has to be reported to the clinician because then the prognosis is not good and whatever action the uh, clinician has to take has to be taken as soon as possible well with that i'll uh, close this uh, saga i i think it was not a long one i tried to simplify it uh, i would like to salute our indian army not only the army the entire defense forces the national disaster force and everyone to being uh, helping us out during these monsoon seasons and throughout the year so salute to this indian army i would like to give this belt the world boxing championship belt it is wbc but for me it is wbc belt to the uh wbc is the warriors of my peripheral blood smear system and uh, i would wish all of you a very happy festive season which is going to come i would request you all to take utmost care be safe enjoy it with your family welcome ganpati bappa tomorrow and i wish uh with in sanskrit it's sarve bhavantu sukhina sarve santu niramaya or may all of us stay happy and healthy thank you very much uh thank you so much dr bhagwat for absolutely wonderful session a best thing like you covered everything from very basics to all principle and everything about the machine instrument and particularly we came to know the importance of uh, different analyzers and how this analyzers can make like a world of a difference in the diagnosis many a time many a times we tend to miss uh, scatter or histograms but these are so relevant in the today's world and they give such a good indication for everything and um, i'm sure audience here would have loved the presentation as much as i did and must be ready with many queries and the particularly you 
cases which you soon were great so i think now it's the time for question and answer session so let's start with that and like i have first question from from dr chakravarti uh, do atypical or abnormal lymphocytes always mean for malignant etiology yeah so as per the recommendations from the icsh it is that abnormal or atypical should be used only for malignant etiology and if you think it is a benign etiology it is better to use the terminology of a reactive lymphocyte this is just to uh, avoid any kind of confusion but as i said it is always good to uh, write down or describe the cell and if you are not very much sure at least you must indicate to the clinician what you think it is whether it is a reactive or whether it is a abnormal or atypical lymphocyte now abnormal and atypical are words as i told used for anything which is not normal or anything which is not typical there is a uh, so but as per the recommendation abnormal or atypical we will use only in malignant etiology second there is a european recommendation also in which um, they give it as atypical suspect reactive atypical suspect malignant so uh, th that is another way of representing or writing down your report so it is absolutely your wish uh, whatever you want to get it but one it should be consistent second your clinician must know what you are tending uh, trying to say so another terminology that you can very well use is atypical and then write suspect as reactive or suspect as malignant so that is one more thing which you can do but if if a cell which is not typical it is atypical a reactive is also atypical but just to avoid the confusion we write atypical or abnormal only in those cells which are uh, from a malignant etiology and uh, reactive for those which uh, looks like of benign etiology you are free to use atypical suspect or atyp atypical suspect reactive or atypical suspect malignant uh, very true dr bhagwat i think dr chakravarti must be satisfied with the answer yeah and there is one more question uh, are toxic granules as are these are important markers for prognosis as you were like showing a case on toxic granules so yeah in fact uh, seeing toxic changes uh, is a uh, uh, critical uh, call out criteria uh, basically because toxic changes mean septicemia so uh, you need to start whatever uh, intravenous uh, antibiotics as soon as possible so these toxic changes are very very important and in fact uh, in the the when we were in tata medical center or uh, the institutions usually the doctors or the surgeons would come up and uh, specifically ask for you to look into the smear for toxic granules or the toxic uh, cytoplasmic vacuolations or the dole bodies sometimes you may get confused for for, for in in some uh, cases which are on gcsf uh specifically those uh, patients who are on chemotherapy who take gcsf to raise their wbc count you might find certain um, such uh, granules into the uh, cytoplasm of uh, neutrophils in that case you could just write if you have a history it is good enough if, if you don't have a history and you are not very sure uh, you can very well write it as a coarse cytoplasmic granule you must look into the color if it is a basophilic mostly it is a toxic uh, granule the other thing is usually these toxic changes have two or three common things that is they are associated with left shifting they are associated with cytoplasmic vacuolations and you might see a dole bodies so if you are seeing all these four you can very well write toxic changes um, and it is important to notify it is important to critical call out such toxic changes because these are life saving uh, call outs yeah perfectly fine uh like i know you are not ready to talk uh, about covid but there was one question regarding tb and k analysis so yes. like uh, what will the ideal time like if you plan to uh, go for see uh, see there are two things to this question one is we don't have still the cut off value set up for the indian population or the covid cases of india so uh, uh, putting this test would first uh, i would really like that we have some um, 
cut off values from the indian scenario and there are many studies going on in india so we'll soon get those and the the most ideal time would be when the patient is diagnosed and is going to see the doctor after the first diagnosis of covid-19 okay okay got it uh, dr bhagwat i think we can go like for questions but since we are running short of time so i think we can answer the questions uh, uh if they on mail or something if i, I get any questions i will uh, pass that question to you and you can revert back if you have time sure sure enough sure enough and so one question i will like to take and it's from again dr ankush in case to please do explain why there is basophilia i think uh, he is talking about the cases of uh, dengue so, so so these pseudo basophilias usually come because uh, these uh, horiba machines are for that matter of fact most of the machines would count basophil separately and they use a reagent which which is lysing all the other cells and therefore you are left only with the basophils and you these basophils are lyse resistant and therefore that chamber counts the cell which are only lyse resistant cells and for that chamber it is basophil but these reactive lymphocytes sometimes tend to be lyse resistant and therefore when basophils are being counted in this lyse resistant chamber the reactive lymphocytes also get counted into the basophil channel Yes, yes. I hope I have answered. Yeah, absolutely right, uh, Doctor Bhagwat. Okay, now moving on. Thank you for this question and session. Uh, I will just take few minutes of your time. Uh, allow me to thank some of the audience who have registered on our website HABX uh, or Hematology Analyzer Based Exchanges. Following last webinar, this website is a small effort from Horiba to bring like-minded people. I mean, who are interested in hematology. Uh, to give them a common digital platform here healthcare professionals can learn hematology its parameter their clinical utilities and recent advancements this also provides unique opportunity to publish technical write ups scientific literature useful videos and also helps hematology researchers and students to conduct research studies on the subject so to learn more join our website www.hbx.in and get introduced to the endless possibility in hematology uh, like uh, with this i will end my webinar and request you all to join or register and hbx so i would like to take this opportunity to thank dear audience for their time and constant support i remain most grateful for your rapt attention uh, we will be sending you participant certification too and once again thank you dear audience and dr bhagwat for this brilliant and interesting session on wbc uh, we will look forward to seeing you next time and we'll put extra effort into making our next program even more useful and thrilling so stay tuned for the next session thank you once again stay home stay safe namaste thank you bye